Sure. Shall we? All right. So we begin. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming, logging in uh, morning on the East Coast and afternoon in Lebanon. My name is Nasreen Salti. I am the faculty advisor of the Princeton Bobst AUB Collaborative Initiative, and I have the honor of presenting this event to you today. I want to start first by saying a few words about the Collaborative Initiative. This is a joint effort uh, by the Bopes Center at Princeton University and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at AUB. And um, the goal of this initiative is to promote studies relating to the Middle East in order to advance the causes of peace, mutual understanding, and justice. And it's a unique collaboration in that it seeks to leverage both institutions' intellectual capital and mutual interest to raise awareness about the politics of transformation in the Middle East and North Africa. It's directed by the fantastic Professor Amani Jamal, who's been a mentor and a pillar of support for me and for AUB in general, and who's also the Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs. And the sorts of projects that the initiative supports vary, and they include um, conversations like the one that we're about to start today, conferences, workshops, visiting professorships, public lectures, student exchanges. And you can check out um, our upcoming events uh, by, by going to the initiative page on the Bob Center website, uh, the, Bob, uh, the Princeton University site. And, well, the AUB site also has a, uh, a website under construction, so hopefully soon we'll be posting our future events. I'll put a link to that in the chat box um, so you can check out our future events. None of these events would have been possible without the tireless and always smiling support of Christy Gavantes at Princeton and Lara Kishishan at AUB, and they are a fantastic team to work with. I you know, couldn't wish for a better uh, support for, than, than these two. The initiative has also been very fortunate to gain the invaluable support and, more importantly, the trust of uh, Dean Faris Dahdah, so we thank him for that, and the patient and institutional guidance of uh, Associate Dean Pierre Karam, who's been sort of tirelessly holding our hands uh, for, for years now. Um, and so to leverage both institutions' intellectual capital, we're also very happy to start collaborating with other centers at AUB including the Beirut Urban Lab, uh, the Global Engagement Initiative, and there would like to acknowledge and thank uh, Rami Khouri and Danya Haddad, the co-directors, for their continued support of our initiative and involvement with it. And of course, the Aysan Faris Institute, which is very well represented today in this event by its director, Joseph Bahoud. So without further ado, I'd like to start this conversation from Beirut which is a, an event that we hope to make a regular occurrence in our calendar of events, and that's intended to bring views from the ground in Beirut on issues that are very recent and so have not necessarily yet made it into scholarship or the academy, and yet they're expert views. So we're very honored today to be welcoming our two distinguished speakers, Joseph Bahout, who is the director of the Aysan Fadis Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at at the American University of Beirut. He's also an associate professor of practice in political studies. Prior to that, he'd been a visiting then non-resident senior scholar at the Carnegie Endowment's Middle East program in Washington, DC. He'd been professor of Middle East politics at Sciences Po in Paris and served as permanent consultant for the policy planning unit, which is a Centre d'Analyse de Prévision et de Stratégie, uh, CAPS, at the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Bahout is a graduate of uh, the Department of Economics at AUB, which was where I am uh, normally housed. And uh, before getting it, he, after that, he got a diploma in international relations from the Institut d'études politiques de Paris um, at Sciences Po, and then a PhD in political science at the same institution. He's a fellow of the Geneva Center for Security Policy. It has been a fellow of the Crown Center for Middle Eastern Studies at Brandeis University. He's also the author of two books on Syria's business community and its political outlook in 1994 and on Lebanon's political reconstruction in 98. And I'm also joined today by the very distinguished Dr. Salam Fayyad, who is an economist and former prime minister of the Palestinian Authority and was at the International Monetary Fund between 1987 and 2001. His tenure included serving as IMF resident representative in the, in the West Bank and Gaza Strip between 96 and 2001. 
He then served as manager of the Arab Bank in Palestine, and in June 2002 was named Minister of Finance of the Palestinian Authority. In um, June 2007, he was appointed as prime minister, a position he held until he stepped down in June 2013. And shortly thereafter, he founded Future for Palestine, a nonprofit development foundation. Currently, Dr. Fayyad is a visiting senior scholar and lecturer in public policy at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He's also a distinguished statesman with the Atlantic Council's Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security and a distinguished fellow at the Brookings Institution. Dr. Fayyad also is a graduate of the AUB Economics Department and um, actually of AUB. I'm not going to claim that he's a, he's, a, he's from my department, uh, an MBA from St. Edwards University and a PhD in economics from the University of Texas at Austin. Now, anyone in the event that has a question for either of our speakers, please feel free to post that in the Q&A window that is uh, available on Zoom. Um, please know that the session is recorded. And with that, I'll hand it over to Professor Amani Jamal, who will be moderating this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nisreen, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, this morning on the East Coast afternoon in, in, Bay, in the Middle East. Um, it's a real true honor to have um, my colleagues, uh, Joseph Bahut and Salam Fayyad with us uh, on this uh, wonderful event and to hold this really timely conversation. So I'm going to jump in with the first question, if I may. Um, both of you are experts of regional politics. Both of you have navigated regional politics and analyzed uh, how regional developments affect the, uh, up different countries in the region. So I'll start with the, the, the new Saudi Arabia Iranian rapprochement uh, between the two countries. Um, and I want to sort of get your uh, insights um, on, on um, Joseph, on what this, what this means, not only for the region, what does it mean for, for other regional countries, uh, Lebanon in particular, but what does it mean for the, also the configuration of other alliances? And the way we're structuring this conversation is that, Joseph, you will jump in and Salam will sort of respond in conversation with you. Okay, uh, thank you first of all. Thank you very much, uh, dear Amani, and uh, for, for hosting and organizing this. And thank you for your um, tremendous effort in, in putting up all this uh, venture, the Bob's uh, engagement, uh, this collaboration with AUB. And I'm very happy to be uh, the, the first, uh, let's say the first product of that in this uh, webinar today. Thank you, Nisreen, for your introduction and to the entire team uh, with you. Uh, Christy, Lara, and everyone. Uh, of course, I'm honored to be also with Dr. Fayyad today. Uh, to answer your question, so uh, we're focusing now in, in this first question on uh, uh, this kind of unexpected and uh, surprising, at least in its space, uh, deal or rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, Nisreen was talking about current affairs that are not yet in the, the academic field or, or, or not enough uh, studied or uh, analyzed. I should say that we are all surprised, uh, first of all, by the occurrence of what happened, but mainly also by the depth and rapidity of what is happening. I mean, since the, the, the first uh, encounter in Beijing, or at least the announcement in Beijing between uh, the two, the Saudi and the, and the Iranian envoy, things have been going very fast. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's been less than one month. And today, now, a few minutes from now, uh, the Saudi, um, Saudi foreign minister just landed in Damascus and is now sitting with President Assad uh, in, in the palace in Damascus. So the pace of these shifts and normalizations and, and rapprochement is really... Uh, really surprising. So we should be humble and a little bit modest in our assessment. Now, very quickly, uh, what lies what lays behind? What, why? Why was this? Uh, I think first of all, and this leads us to the macro picture, to the global picture. I think that everybody is now starting to take the measure, the exact measure, or at least the perceived exact measure 
of what the U.S. retrenchment from the region uh, means. I think that uh, the Saudi leadership is increasingly aware that now they have to take uh, their own initiatives. They have to take their matters in their own hands. Uh, Prince, uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has embarked on a very ambitious plan for Saudi Arabia, Vision 2030, regardless of uh, if it will work or not, I think that uh, partly the political side of that is that the Saudi leadership is seeking for a sort of, I would say, zero problem policy, uh, to paraphrase what Erdogan has tried to do more than a decade ago. I hope for Saudi Arabia it will be more successful than Erdogan's uh, venture. Uh, but so there is a sort of uh, a need of pacification of relations with all the, in the, the environment and the neighborhood, which is a stark difference from uh, with what uh, Prince Ben Salman was incarnating a few years ago when he embarked on a war in Yemen, uh, a very, uh, uh, let's say, fierce clash and show of force with Iran uh, on many theaters and also uh, on, on other issues like, for example, uh, uh, more distant from the Middle East and the Levant, like, for example, in Libya and elsewhere. So now we have a sort of de-escalation. For the Iranian side, the need is also, is also um, obvious. I mean, Iran is today uh, economically strangled. It is encircled. The latest protests have been uh, quite a, a warning uh, signal to the leadership in Tehran. And also, I think uh, now that Iran perceived that there's no GCPOA inside, there's no deal on the nuclear issue with the US and the West, it's also buying some insurances, uh, insurance policies uh, in its immediate neighborhood, also embarking in a set of de-escalations, having also, and this is very important, I think, having the feeling that it has fulfilled most of its objectives in the region, in the Yemen, for example, on the Yemen theater, uh, the peace is probably done on uh, uh, more or less on the terms of Iran. Iran has uh, succeeded in uh, keeping the Houthis resistance until the end. So now Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states will have to accept this player. In Iraq, uh, Iran is, is sharing uh, predominance with the US. In Syria, it has saved Assad and now probably forcing normalization of the regime with the Arab neighborhood. And in Lebanon, it has won. The big question, and it, it will bring us to Lebanon and I'll stop at there, is for Iran what to do with this victory or what to do with these small victories. And to do something meaningful, probably Iran thinks that it has to normalize gradually or rapidly with its Arab neighborhood and with Saudi Arabia uh, first and foremost. This is why I think the convergence of both parties is, is very interesting. Uh, both have now a, a vested interest in de-escalating, in finding uh, ways to coexist together more or less peacefully. It doesn't mean that the rift is over. It doesn't mean that the competition is over, but it means that now there is a new way to organize this competition, probably to organize a sort of competitive coexistence, I would say, between Iran and Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Arab family on theaters that remain to be analyzed. And here we'll get back maybe later to Lebanon. These theaters are uh, Yemen, of course, Iraq, probably, Syria, most probably, and Lebanon cannot escape that given the way and interest, uh, the way of Hezbollah and Iran and the interest of uh, the Gulf and Saudi Arabia remains to see how deep this understanding will reach the lateral theaters, but at least now on the bilateral level between Saudi Arabia and Iran, things are going very fast and very deep. Today, for example, and I'll end there, uh, we had the, uh, 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 let's say, the reciprocal acceptance by King Salman and by President Raisi in Iran to visit uh, Riyadh and Tehran in the months to come soon after Ramadan. It gives you an idea of the tremendous space and magnitude of this rapprochement. If it holds, I think that we can uh, say it without grandiloquence and without exaggeration, it will be a, a huge game changer in the region for the decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Salam, but I want to, uh, Dr. Salam, I want to give you, you're going to respond to, to Joseph. I'm curious about just two points, and please feel free to, to include your own points. Is Iran victorious in the region? 
And I hope we also bring in the Palestinian uh, theater as well as a theater that might have been affected by this with the Abrahamic Accords and whatnot. But Dr. Salam. Okay. Uh, we'll do. Thank, th thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you all uh, uh, on this day, Ramadan Kareem, everybody. Uh, thank you, Nasri, for the warm introduction. And as a matter of fact, uh, I agree with all that you said about the importance of this initiative, the BOPS uh, AUB collaborative initiative. And I will add one more thing that uh, special means something to me. Uh, it's a bridge between a home of mine some 50 years ago and my current home at Princeton. Uh, I mean, say I'm uh, happy with where I am, but I'm envious uh, of where you are. Uh, those were good old days rather to where we are now, although 70s and 80s, 90s were very difficult period, especially 70s, 80s for Lebanon. Uh, one thing uh, that Dr. Bahut said that caught my attention, as a matter of fact, and I would want to underscore. Uh, which is the importance of being modest in terms of how much we might want to expect out of this important rapprochement. It, it, it is very significant. That there is no question about that. And it reminds me of those long civil war years in, in, in Lebanon, particularly early on, when anytime something of the diplomatic nature happens, a meeting, a phone call, or something like that, uh, everybody would be speculating that was going to be to bring about an end to the war and um, bright future for Lebanon and everything else. There was a lot of that. Conditions now are a lot more complex and complicated than they were then. Then they lent themselves to some kind of reasonable assessment here and there uh, about a better tomorrow somehow. Uh, the region now has been engulfed in, in conflict for a long period of time, fractured more, more so. Than, than harmony, uh, a lot more so than harmony. Uh, which brings me to the second point that I agree with Dr. Bakot on, in addition to the need for us to be measured and modest in terms of what might be expected of this rapprochement, notwithstanding its huge significance, which is how sustainable this is. Uh, is this going to be sustainable? And the answer to this actually uh, lies in something which you also highlighted. It depends on the extent to which it responds to the longer term needs of the principles to this uh, rapprochement, Saudi Arabia on the one hand, and uh, Arab world generally on the one hand, and Iran on the other. Uh, we can, uh, based on what we know about what um, Iranian policy is, what pronouncements are, what uh, experts who are close to the regime have been saying all along, what they really wanted, uh, from the Arab world was to work out an arrangement whereby American security presence is done with. That's what they say, that's what they intimate, uh, and what. Whether or not that is something that is the offing, how that fits into the agenda, which also uh, uh, Joseph mentioned about America retreating from re the region, whether that would mean also somehow a truncating, uh, truncating its military presence or security presence that I think is a tall order. I, I just don't see that really happening. On the Saudi side, on the Arab side generally, on the Saudi side in particular, the question is how will this agreement or rapprochement respond to the need, to Arab need of reducing tension and friction in, in areas where Iran has been quite active. And a number of theaters were mentioned and they were all right in the Gulf region itself as a matter of fact, uh, you have Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and also the question of Palestine uh, in Lebanon, meaning in refugee camps in Lebanon, but also uh, in Palestine itself. So there are all of these issues, and the, the, the question is how, how much went into the discussion that led to this rapprochement about the need to uh, kind of really bring the tension down. I think personally, an opportunity was missed at the time the GCPOA was first agreed on the part of it. And that was failure on the part of the Arabs, let me just say. Rather than at the time opposing what was about to happen, uh, and in the process really take a position that was identical, identical to the position Israel took on the possibility of a deal, it would have been much better and more productive for, for Arab countries to, as a matter of fact, insist 
on including the region, the regional tensions as part of this course on that agreement. And we know where things stand right now. Uh, I mentioned the agreement or the rapprochement has to respond to the strategic needs of both sides. Uh, important among uh, the issues on Iran's mind, obviously, is the question of sanctions. Uh, given where things are, I just don't see that happening. Again, I go back to the point about the need to really be modest about what might be expected out of this. Nevertheless, it's something to build on and, 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 and to try to really do something about and maybe in the process, a new dynamic, positive dynamic can be created. I mean, let's just not really be too cynical, basically what I'm really saying. It happened, okay? It responded to immediate needs of the parties in ways that are obvious, you know, for, for the Iranians where they were in negotiations, especially with the United States on, on a possible deal. Uh, and we know where that stands right now. For the Saudis, given, you know, the kind of relationship uh, that they have been having with the United States in, in, in recent years, not, not a very settled situation there. And to some extent, we haven't said much about China, a, a little bit, a, a role for China, even though that was, in my assessment, more on the production side than on the substance side. So let's just see you know, what can be done with this. Uh, would it withstand, basically, the pressures emanating from the regional tensions persisting on the one hand, and on the other, Iran's desire to really see the sanctions lifted? you know, on the other. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. My last point also takes me back to the 70s when, when I was at the time in my early 20s, you know, whenever something happened, uh, we kind of really came up with all kinds of constructions that really um, were about a better, I mean, an end to the war conflict, better tomorrow or that sort of thing, uh, right? There was in our thinking naivety at the time, even though conditions were a lot simpler. Uh, and the relationships were a lot more linear than, than they are today. I don't think we should today fall in the trap of assuming now that this happened, there is some kind of really automaticity to things happening. And that brings me to the narrow focus on Lebanon. When we talk about reducing tensions, as a matter of fact, in, in, in the region, what happens? I mean, I think uh, Dr. Mahmoud kind of mentioned quickly, he said in, in, in Lebanon, Iran won uh, kind of thing. Uh, when we really look at Lebanon, basically where things stand, if the situation there, politically speaking, is going to settle in a better place relative where it has been uh, for past many years right now, it seems to me Lebanon has to compete, you know, with other potential beneficiaries from, from this rapprochement. There is no automaticity to this, none whatsoever. And when we say Lebanon, which Lebanon are we talking about? I mean, we say, the, you know, one thing that really actually uh, uh, a salient feature of the region, when we say Iran and the Arabs, Iran is one country, Arab countries, there are all kinds of rivalries. Now, Saudi Arabia is in the forefront, but I think at some point this has to really be sorted out. I mean, I hope it, there will be some kind of really pan-Arab consensus on how to deal with these issues. But it seems to me Lebanon does have to compete for the attention of the principal here. But which Lebanon and what kind of agenda and on the basis of which might Lebanon, you know, approach this in order to, for it to position itself to compete effectively. Uh, alongside with that, I think Lebanon should really focus, and this is really an important thing, on trying to really get the country out of the trouble it's right, it, it is in right now. Uh, the fact that there has been failure in electing president is one, but most importantly, I think, the dreadful socioeconomic conditions in Lebanon. This is not really something that's me. Anyone who really has some kind of idea as to how to move there, maybe take advantage of this approach in some way to really help bring out better conditions in, in Lebanon, which is a tall order, there's no question. That might be an agenda that Lebanese can really agree on, but it seems to me they really have to come up with some kind of really internal consensus on how to position themselves effectively to compete. Seems to me from point of view Iran, um, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, Yemen is more important, if I may say that, you know, so I can, on the face of it, uh, can, can Lebanon compete? Uh, but there's a question of what all of this, as, as Dean Jovan mentioned, uh, you know, what that really implies for the Palestinian theater. Uh, any implications possibly a time of rising tensions in Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon? This has always been a significant issue in internal Lebanese politics, as well as you know, the broader uh, question of Palestine. 
So I stop here, but, but thank you very much for the opportunity. It's wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you so much for that. And so to the next round uh, on that building on um, the, the specific ramifications or consequences for Lebanon, Joseph, um, you know, uh, Salam talked about a lot of different issues on the table in terms of leadership, in terms of the economic situation, in terms of you had also sort of uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the upcoming presidential election. So if we wanted to sort of think about the theater in Lebanon, um, we know that both Iran and Saudi Arabia have a a direct arm, if you may, in, in Lebanon. What what will this mean for the for the future of not only you know political stability, if you may, but this uh, you know really getting this issue of uh, economic development, corruption, uh, stability, financially uh, underway in, in in the country. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Amani, if you allow me, just before uh, I'll, I'll answer thoroughly the Lebanese part of the question, but I would like to add and prolong a little bit what Dr. Fayad has just said uh, on, on the external conditions, and I completely agree here. Uh, I mean, if we examine uh, the, 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 let's say, the conditions of viability of this deal or rapprochement, it is fragile on many fronts. Uh, because, in fact, it has also several spoilers, potentially. Uh, the, the, the forces that have been taken aback by this rapprochement or left over or left outside are, uh, are, not, are here to stay and they will probably try to reinsert themselves in the game. Uh, I won't expand too much on that, but just I will mention, of course, uh, Israel, for example, that perceives that this could be a competition, a bad competition with the Abraham Accords, uh, seeing uh, probably the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia, uh, 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 let's say, uh, drifting away from the construction that Israel wanted, in fact, through the Abraham Accords, at least partly, uh, namely to build a wall against Iran. Today, this architecture is, is put in question again. The U.S. is a potential, uh, maybe not spoiler, but uh, I don't think it is uh, perceiving with a lot of pleasure, uh, the intrusion of a mega new player like China in the Middle East. Uh, I think the, the rivalry between the US and China is something that will probably characterize the next century or the coming century. Uh, Washington was not expecting China as a, as a political, diplomatic, potent player in the region. It was accepting its technological and economic inroads uh, in the region, but now it has to confront uh, something of a uh, much different nature. And on that note, a, a very small uh, idea also on China. China is taking a huge risk here because China has, in fact, uh, take the bet of underwriting such a rapprochement and becoming a, a big player in a chessboard that it's not very much used to. Uh, this is a lot of heavy lifting to do. If one of the two partners fail China, China will be responsible and will appear as a power that is not able to, uh, let's say, uh, construct anything meaningful diplomatically in the region. And this would usher to a bad start for uh, Beijing in the region. So we have a lot of unknowns. Now, uh, let's plunge from this very macro picture to the very micro picture of Lebanon and answer your question. Uh, first, when, when, uh, when the agreement was signed in Beijing between uh, uh, minister, between the two, uh, the two representatives of Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, the feeling in Lebanon was that, or uh, the feeling with Lebanese experts, was that Lebanon would probably be the last wagon in the train. Uh, Yemen would be first, maybe Iraq, then Syria, but if anything, this will reach out Lebanon one day. In fact, today, it's not exactly the case. We can feel that uh, the consequences for Lebanon are, are already felt uh, here. Now, um, they are felt as a climate, but we still don't know if, if something in the political equation have changed. Now, uh, like always, and probably Dr. Fayad here will, will smile because it will remind him of things in the past, the Lebanese were very quick in thinking that they were the core of the issue. So uh, a few hours after the agreement or the rapprochement, 
each uh, camp of the political divide in Lebanon thought that uh, the sun was shining for, uh, for, for him or for them. So uh, let's say the camp of Hezbollah said, uh, or the pro-Hezbollah camp said, okay, now Saudi Arabia has surrendered and it will accept all the conditions of Hezbollah and Iran in Lebanon. And the other side or the other camp said, okay, Iran is badly in need for something and for an overture or an opening. So it will accept that Saudi Arabia regains back its uh, pawns and the horses and place on the chessboard in Lebanon. Now today, nothing of that has exactly happened. Uh, the two things are at stake here in the long and medium term. The first thing and the testing, let's say the, 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 the litmus test will be the change in behavior of Hezbollah for Saudi Arabia. They have to perceive that something has changed in the behavior. Uh, of course, any illusion of seeing uh, Hezbollah uh, 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 rendering its weapons tomorrow or changing its skin or etc. is illusory, of course. But there should be a sort of change of approach towards exactly what I said, and Dr. Fayyad uh, took it again, uh, this kind of, the management of the of the trophy that is Lebanon by Hezbollah. The management has to change, uh, and, and, and Saudi Arabia is waiting for that. The second thing, and Hezbollah is probably waiting to see that in the Saudi behavior, is how deep will be uh, the Saudi and then the Gulfi and then the Arab uh, financial and uh, monetary involvement in, uh, let's say, the redeeming of the country, a country that is today almost uh, collapsed or comatose or dead. So I think that these two issues will be uh, will be the quid pro quo or the tit for tat between uh, between the two powers here. Now, in the immediate, where would uh, this translate, or where should it translate? It should translate, in first and foremost, uh, on the presidential issue. Uh, Lebanon has been without a president, without a functioning government. Uh, before the Saudi-Iranian uh, rapprochement, France was trying to play a role uh, by bridging, uh, let's say, the gap between the stakeholders in the region and by conveying messages between the many parties, mainly between the Saudis and Hezbollah, uh, between the Americans and uh, the Iranians through Hezbollah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now that this uh, direct channel is uh, established, uh, I mean, the picture of uh, Minister Ben Farhan and Minister Ben Lahyan, Abdel Lahyan, a week ago, uh, sitting together for 24 hours. I think that, uh, very frankly, I, I, I can't. I mean, I can't imagine that Lebanon has not been evoked by the two ministers. It means that, in fact, uh, the third parties today and the role of third parties is seriously diminished. Probably they will exchange messages uh, directly uh, between each other. Uh, remains to be seen if uh, the candidate that Hezbollah is today openly supporting, mainly in Lebanon, Suleiman Frangie, will accept to, uh, let's say, get out of the race and accept that he can't be elected because the rapprochement is going towards a candidate that is more, let's say, a consensual candidate, someone that is accepted by all parties. This is one question. The second question that the Saudis have very frankly and openly put on the table in Paris and with the Iranian, uh, let's say, uh, interlocutors, is that it's not anymore a question of persons, a question of uh, figures, a question of choices. And here, and probably Dr. Fayyad uh, knows more about that, we have to take into account and to really acknowledge and uh, let's say to, to measure the importance of a very important shift in the Saudi behavior lately. It has been very clearly expressed by uh, the Minister of Finance of Saudi Arabia in Davos a few months ago when he said, and he repeated it to uh, President Sisi lately, Saudi Arabia is not anymore here to give free lunches to anyone. So every penny that will be put in uh, the salvation of Lebanon, uh, in that case, or other countries, uh, Palestinian Authority, maybe at one point, will have to be very carefully vetted. This money will have to be given in the framework of a very solid roadmap 
I won't say of reform and, and uh, let's say better governance, but at least in terms of financial viability and feasibility. And here, I think the problem of the governance in Lebanon becomes uh, entire and complete as Dr. Salam uh, has said. I think that beyond the president of the Republic, beyond probably the next prime minister, maybe also beyond the next governor of the central bank, what the Saudis would like to see, and this is where Hezbollah will be to attest, is a complete, a very different way of doing things, of governing things, of planning things, of implementing things. It will be the case in Lebanon. I think it will be the case in Syria and probably elsewhere. Maybe all this is a very grandiose ideas. Maybe we'll fall back to a very classical way of doing things. Uh, the way we are used to them in the region. But I don't think that after such a rupture of relations, uh, after such a, let's say, radical change within the governance of, of Saudi Arabia, at least, we will see a return to uh, business as usual, uh, like before. Here, and I will stop there, the ball uh, becomes in the, in the court of the Lebanese. It's up to the Lebanese to be uh, let's say, uh, up to the challenge that is uh, given to them, the challenge and the opportunity to, uh, that is given to them. There is today a new climate in the region. There is for them the chance of being a country where uh, the two external foes uh, through their local clients, namely Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, were quarreling, being today uh, on, a, on a much more harmonious page. It's up to them to take this uh, to take this opportunity and try to build a minimally acceptable Lebanese governance. Uh, and this is, I think, uh, the task that only the Lebanese could do. Excellent, excellent, Joseph. Thank you so much for that. Um, Dr. Salam, if you can respond to Joseph on these points and for our listeners, uh, please um, start putting your questions in the chat. So we will turn to uh, questions in, uh, in, in a few minutes after Dr. Salam uh, chimes in. Yeah, uh, let me take advantage of this opportunity to go back to something you mentioned quickly in the other round about maybe possible bone of contention being uh, Abraham Accords, what the implications are of being like this. There could be some, but it's one of many things, as a matter of fact, because when we say Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia did this with Iran, but, but Saudi Arabia has strong ties with other important Arab players who are already there uh, in, in, in those agreements. So it's not going to really be something in the nature of an abrupt, uh, I guess, uh, 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 issue, uh, but more like how to really deal with what has happened so far. I mean, a lot of adjustments have to take place uh, in the same vein that Dr. Bahut mentioned about Hezbollah. The fact of the matter is, uh, uh, we all know basically Hezbollah's the kind of platform it stands on when it comes, for example, uh, Saudi Arabia. I mean, standard part of Hassan Nasrallah's speeches or the attacks on Saudi Arabia. Now, that has to change, obviously. Uh, so, some adjustment there, but I do not know if it's going to really go to be that impactful. I mean, the whole question of Abraham Accord uh, generally. Uh, on this in, in, in an abrupt way, but we'll see how that plays out. But I go back to something very important in terms of internal Lebanese questions. I mean, yes, there is the issue of presidential elections. Lebanon is without president, and so government is not functional. Uh, this is not the first time, you know, Lebanon finds itself without president, and not the longest, uh, needless to say. Uh, now conditions are more difficult. I mean, in, in some way more complicated, yes. So you need the politics to begin to get better. Let me be very honest with you. I just don't see that happening easily or quickly. I mean, uh, if it could have been done, it would have been done a long time ago. Uh, I see no prospect of um, something happening that really actually would alter the course of internal Lebanese politics uh, from where they have been for the past decades, as a matter of fact. Very difficult state of discord and a lack of harmony. So therefore, in, under conditions like these, what would be maybe a possibility for everybody to agree on is to kind of leave that aside. I mean, try to really work out political arrangements, accommodation, what have you, 
to the fullest extent possible. But have everyone sort of your focus, and maybe this is something that will tie up also with something that Dr. Mahout said about Saudi Arabia and its new disposition on the provision of aid. Well, everybody agrees on the need to deal with Lebanon's crippling uh, you know, financial situation, economic crisis, let's just put it this way. Have that currently separated from everyone else. You know, come up with a program that is capable, has the promise, the potential of lifting Lebanon from the dreadful misery it's in right now, it has been in for, it's in a state of downfall. That affects everybody, certainly, and especially the poor in Lebanon. Now, if political parties balk against the possibility mere possibility of sitting around the table of agreeing on a platform for revival for Lebanon, economically, you know, and with it socially, I hope, then I think they're good for nothing, and they'd lose in the eyes of people more than they have so far. To shift the focus on internal Palestinian politics towards that as, as much as you possibly can, and be, begin to, what would we really need to do politically to get this done, as opposed to keeping the focus on where the ball is, who is the minister of what and who is the president and who is that? Let's just really agree on what is really needed, what needs to happen. And put that in the hands of experts. Lebanon, Lebanon is not more poor when it comes to expertise. They have a lot of talent and, and they can rebuild their own country. I'm, I'm, I'm certain of this. Focus on that and let that be the platform on the basis of which Lebanon attempts to compete in this new environment. Take advantage of the, this rapprochement because everybody can be ashamed, politically speaking, in the court of public opinion, if they are seen to really be opposing that kind of focus and that kind of prioritization, and that's what I'm really calling for. Should that happen, then that would respond not only to the need, which I see as welcome a development, by the way, on the part of Saudi Arabia to actually not be the source of unconditional funding, no matter what happens, we just give you the money because we like you, you know, kind of thing, or we have, you know, we place political bets on you which they have done in Lebanon, and, uh, along with other places for a long, way too long. I think that's a welcome shift in the position of Saudi Arabia. That's not something to be feared, it's, it's to be encouraged and welcome. And it's against the backdrop of that, the expectations of the international community generally and donors generally for there to be some assurance as to possibility prospect of there being light at the end of this long tunnel, uh, that really takes us back to square one, which is the need for Lebanon to come up to forge agreement on a program, technocratically speaking, that's capable of addressing the socioeconomic needs, the devastating financial crisis, economic crisis country faces right now. This may sound mundane, but, but that's what we can work with. And that really happens to be the most compelling uh, uh, agenda item from the point of view of people, you know, try to respond to what really people would want to say. Uh, politics will, I think, over time get fixed, uh, but to keep the focus there uh, on who is running, who is not running, or if if the focus is entirely, for example, out with the rapprochement on maybe solving the presidential issue, uh, then then what? Uh, so let's just say, uh, you know, the the current logjam is, is, is a rule and there is a, a president. If there is no, you know, Lab, uh, you know intra-Lebanese consensus on, on an agenda for what is really required to leave this country from the problems it's facing, then that's really not going to really last too long. Lebanon did have president before the vacuum that we have right now. And it was really going down the tube with that president at the helm. So resolving that it may appear to be responding to a, a pressing read right now, but, you know, the day after, you know, we'll go back to where we are unless the focus shifts dramatically in the direction of addressing the needs of people right now, uh, here and now. Thank you so much, Dr. Salam, for that. Um, we do have a, a question from one of our listeners, Fadi. <laughs> Fadi asks, are we still waiting for the Turkish elections before having a clear picture? of the fate of possible deal in the northern part of Syria. In case of a deal, in case a deal takes place, how long are the Turkish forces expected to withdraw or when will the Turkish forces uh, withdraw across the border in the north? Joseph, I'm gonna hand it to you then to Dr. Salam. 
That, okay. Uh, actually, we haven't we haven't tackled at all uh, Syria and Turkey, uh, so I will, I will very quickly answer this question. I mean, we know that uh, Assad now has uh, put a condition on a meeting with with President Erdogan, which is in fact to meet him after election if he is uh, re-elected. Now, this could change maybe if there's a strong Russian pressure on on uh, President Assad on Bashar al-Assad. But since we are talking about that, I would take this opportunity to. To add something to the uh, let's say to the Lebanese equation, since it's in the headline of of the webinar, uh, Amani, which is uh, Syria and the normalization towards Syria. Um, I think this will be very. Um, it, it's a very difficult question to um, to integrate in the Lebanese equation. Let's say. Um, Many would think that the, the Saudi or the Arab opening towards uh, Bashar al-Assad today, I mean, now it is completely crowned by the Syrian rapprochement. Uh, we could have been skeptical only two or three months ago when the Emiratis were opening up and everybody was saying Saudi Arabia wouldn't do it. Now it's done at the time now we are speaking. And I think that Minister um, Faisal bin Farhan has extended an invitation to Bashar al-Assad to visit Riyadh soon after Ramadan. So things are going fast. The question is, uh, will Syria be back again to the classical role it used to play in Lebanon, namely being the power broker in the country in the name of the Arab community? I think this is a, a very big question. I wouldn't like to believe it's possible, but uh, even if I stay, let's say, lucid, rational, and, and cold-blooded in my analysis, I, uh, I see many reasons that could exclude this. Uh, one is, uh, I think, this, this new Saudi behavior, this new Saudi uh, philosophy of uh, compartmentalizing the files. So it is talking to Syria today about problems regarding Syria and Syria's relation with its environment, mainly uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, issues having to do with drug smuggling and, and, and certain other issues. The second thing, and this would maybe surprise some, uh, some people who are uh, listening to this, uh, I think that Hezbollah's role in Lebanon and in Syria is today in Syria after the civil war in Syria, after the war in Syria, is today maybe somewhere an obstacle to a full-fledged return of the Assad regime uh, uh, to Lebanon. I think that now probably Hezbollah wouldn't like to see someone else, even its allies, uh, the Syrian regime, share its, uh, let's say, uh, undisputed influence in Lebanon. So I think that here, probably there will be something very interesting to follow in the years to come, which is a dynamics between the Syrian regime, if it survives, and its own backers, namely Russia and Iran. I think if you look at closely what is happening today in Syria, inside Syria at many levels, in the business circles, in the military, in the peripheries of the country, you can see a sort of very subtle competition between Russia and Iran. Will this continue in the years to come? How will this reverberate, reverberate on Lebanon? What will be the leeway that Iran, Hezbollah, and then uh, Saudi Arabia and other Arabs will open again to Syria and Lebanon is something very important. Uh, we, uh, I agree completely with Dr. Salam that names and et cetera are not important in Lebanon, but sometimes uh, they bear a certain significance. It's not innocent at all. It's not insignificant at all that the candidate that is today the official candidate of Hezbollah and Amal in Lebanon is the personal childhood friend of Bashar al-Assad. I don't think it's something we can really dismiss as being anecdotal. So if Suleiman Franji is elected, this could give a bonus to the Syrian regime in terms of its interference again in Lebanon. And if Suleiman Franji is not elected, it doesn't mean that Syria's role in Lebanon is, is canceled and completely null, but it means that it has become a little bit more difficult for Syria, probably to dictate certain small and, de and detailed issues in the governance of this country. All this is completely hypothetical and in questions, but I think that these dynamics are going very quickly and very fast, and we have to uh, watch them and monitor them uh, with a lot of care and with a, with a lot of caution.
Thank you so much, Joseph. Dr. Salando, would you like to chime in on that question? Uh, on the question of Turkey and Iran, generally speaking, I, mean, I think that you know underscores the importance for there to be rapprochement within uh, the Arab world to begin with. Um, these are countries that really have demonstrated a knack for wishing to spread their wings wide and throw their weight around. Uh, and that happens, uh, you know, when 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 the region is, I mean, I'm talking about Arab Arab world, uh, is in the state of discord on so many issues, uh, and, and and so uh, question of Lebanon, Syria's role historically and all of that is actually can can be seen through the prism of that. I mean, this whole notion of interventionism in in and, and meddling in other countries' internal affairs and all of that. Uh, throughout history, we've seen evidence of it. I think a way has to be found, some kind of code of conduct, some kind of really arrangement whereby this is minimized. Uh, Lebanon has been theater for that for a very long period of time, uh, long before the emergence of Hezbollah. And, and it has having evolved into the kind of standalone entity in and of itself, uh, as a matter of fact. And uh, uh, in terms of really the power relations and, and weight um, relative to Syria, uh, even at Lebanon. Look at where it is today uh, compared to the way things were early on. So these issues have to really be revisited at some point. I, I hope the arrangement with Iran, the rapprochement with Iran will be an opportunity for this kind of soul ser searching within the Arab uh, world to really try to reduce rivalries, to manage them in, in a better way than has happened so far. The needs of those countries have to also be recognized and all the while uh, you know we're forgetting about uh, you know major challenge that's really face, facing us um, in terms of the continued israeli occup occupation of arab territory uh, and and that keeps on getting marginalized and and uh, more and more with, with each passing day so i i hope all of this would would kind of really point us in that direction in in in, in some way uh, Again, you know, I, I agree, uh, obviously it names better in this particular case. It's not happenstance, let's see what happens. I mean, I'd be very happy if in fact the logjam on, on and, and the parliament would actually have a quorum and elect the president tomorrow. But uh, that president, I think, whoever he may be, uh, should actually really try to focus the country's attention on that. Change the conversation in Lebanon, that's what's really required change the conversation and make it really responsive to the needs of people as much as as, as possible, as opposed to these bigger, bigger issues. Excellent. Um, and so we're really approaching time. I think I have two more minutes. And in the spirit of a very, very timely and uh, fascinating discussion that we're having, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give each of you a minute, and uh, forgive me, to maybe answer um, uh one of the questions that's coming from Rabih, and I'm sorry that we cannot get to all the questions. Uh they just all came in the last three minutes, and uh we 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 uh we have to stop at the top of the hour. Um in Lebanon, I, 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 when I teach on Lebanon, I always say that almost every single conflict in the region has played out in the state of Lebanon. It's, it's sort of like the microcosm of the regional politics. Um do any analysts and with your expertise see this as uh, this this alliance or, or or this rapprochement as a way not alliance rapprochement as as a way of mitigating the Sunni Shia, Sunni Shia divide? Will it play out ideologically? Joseph, um, I mean the short the short answer and probably maybe a risky one would be to say yes, it will mitigate probably. Uh, although I mean you know we we probably tended to exaggerate also the identity nature of the conflict between, uh, I mean, Saudi Arabia, I mean, or at least the Arab Gulf states and Iran. Of course, it entails a component of Sunni Shia divide, of Arab uh, Persian divide, of other identity focused divides, but also there's a, a strong geopolitical, let's say, component. So I, I would be I would be balanced there. Um, the, uh, what, what I would hope for is that this will install a sort of climate and that this climate will lead to um, a progressive resolution of the real issues at stake, not only 
uh, Sunni and Shia and etc. But for example, to pacify the relations between uh, neighbors, for example, between Lebanon and Syria, we have now another avenue of something promising, which is the maritime deal between Lebanon and Israel. This could help Dr. Fayyad uh, Lebanon exploits certain of its resources in a much more uh, meaningful manner. Uh, uh, this uh, climate could also and should also uh, serve to enhance better governance because as much as, uh, or as uh, 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 on the contrary, I mean, as long as the identity conflicts were raging in the region, uh, governance was uh, largely, a, a uh, let's say, a victim of that. Uh, was sacrificed on the altar of these uh, sorts of conflicts. So now that we have this peaceful dynamic in, Le in, in the country, in the region, uh, countries like Lebanon that are the recipient, uh, I mean, the uh, let's say the, the stage of these tensions, I think it has better conditions to take things in, their, in, in its own hands. However, again and again and again, this is the task of Lebanese to do. And I agree with Dr. Fayyad, Lebanese alone, if left to their own tendencies and instincts, could foil any deal, uh, big, uh, small, uh, elusive, or, or solid. So and I think that they will not do uh, time again, this time again. Dr. Mahmoud, thank you so much for that response. Uh, Dr. Fayyad, the floor is yours. Yeah, you know, I, I have an issue with intervention as generally, uh, regardless of who does it, uh, to be honest with you. I mean, the most relevant of all, of course, is, is Israel, what it has done. But uh, a lot of focus, particularly against the backdrop of the confrontation between the West, led by the United States on the one hand, and Iran on the other, uh, okay, uh, that actually shifted the focus a lot in the direction of, well, Maybe there's something about this, you know, uh, Iran, uh, Arab uh, divide, Shia, uh, Sunni, etc. I have as much problem with, with, with Turkish interventionism. I have a problem with any kind of interventions. Uh, My way of, of really saying issue of religious divide has been cynically exploited by those who always had interest, vested interest in perpetuating status quo. Those who really kind of really projected the conflict between Iran with all of its interventionists, which predated the Islamic revolution, by the way, uh, in, in the region, but but certainly, you know, became one on intervention kind of really on steroids after that. There's no question, particularly in the recent decades. There is no issue. That is really the, 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 the problem. The problem is that. We should really look for pragmatic ways for dealing with this. They are a part of the region, Turkey, as well as Iran. It's in our best interest uh, as Arabs to really find a way to cohabitate this region in, 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 a, in a way that responds to the interests of our people. This whole notion about Sunni, Shia, this, that, the other thing, these divides identity issues were exploited by those interested in perpetuating status quo. Iranians come to the table, I mean, we're kind of used to complaining and saying we're the victim and all of that sort of thing. And, you know, competing for whose, whose narrative is, is actually superior to the other when it comes to victimhood. Uh, uh, you know, uh, each side, you know, has, has a long list, litany uh, of, of reasons why they should be happy, unhappy with the other. We should really recognize that. But to really think that, that the underlying cause of this is this uh, competition between Shiite Islam and Sunni Islam is, 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 is grotesquely uh, out of place, to be honest with you. And it's time to really set it aside and really deal with Iran as a country, forget about this business of Shiite, Sunni, and, and all of that. It, it just simply doesn't help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Salam Fayyad. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Joseph Ahud. Uh, this has been a very enlightening and timely conversation. Uh, really fascinating. We will, it, it was recorded, so we will have it on our website. Um, and we hope to you, that all our listeners will continue to follow our conversations from Beirut series. Um, I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Nasrina Salti, who is a, an, an enormous uh, force behind the initiative at the, at the American University of Beirut. And then Christy Gavantes and Lara Kashishian also for their outstanding work. Again, thank you, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Dr. Salam. Um, we look forward to continuing these conversations. And uh, till next time, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.
Thank you.